Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done over 400 of them by now, and if this is new to you, uh, please go to the past interviews menu on batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, where you'll see all the previous ones. Um, this show is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, uh, there's a donate button on every page of the site. And we really appreciate and rely upon the support that we have been receiving in whatever amount, <laughs> large or small. Uh, my guest today is Stephen D'Amico. Stephen is a spiritual teacher, mystical poet, and author. At the age of 22, he went through a profound spiritual transformation that culminated in a permanent realization of his true nature. Since then, his life has been devoted to understanding the spiritual path from an evolutionary perspective and helping others reconnect with their true nature to, bring, to help bring about a global awakening in human consciousness. The main way he does this is through the direct transmission of the enlightened state of being, which connects others with their own true nature. In the past, Stephen has worked in the field of conflict resolution and restorative justice as a mediator, facilitator, trainer, and project leader for youth social action groups. He's also taught at both the elementary and high school levels, focusing on the special needs of students with learning disabilities. Currently, he and his wife, Aniko, run Millwood Melt, a lively grilled cheese restaurant in their beloved community of Leesdale in Toronto. And in honor of that, I had a cheese sandwich uh, for lunch. But it, wa it wasn't grilled. I needed Stephen for that, and he wasn't here. Um, the customers and students playfully refer to Stephen as the grilled cheese guru. When not feeding bodies, Stephen lives and breathes to feed souls. He currently hosts transformational gatherings, satsangs, and offers individuals enlightened guidance and support via phone, Skype, or in person. He's the author of two books, The Incredible State of Absolute Nothingness, A Personal Account of Spiritual Enlightenment, and Heaven on Earth, A Guide to Enlightenment and Human Unity. And I managed to read both of them cover to cover in the past week, and I enjoyed them a lot. So one of the things Stephen did uh, when he was in college was take creative writing courses, and he's a good writer and conveys his experiences very, very clearly, so as I'm sure you'll see in this interview. So Stephen, thanks. Welcome. Well, thank you, Rick. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, good to have you. Um, got a few questions already that came in from people, um, which I'll be asking in the course of the interview. But maybe for starters, your uh, your book, The Incredible State of Absolute Nothingness, um, is a nice, I guess we'd say, biographical account of your life. And uh, it might be good to start on that note. Um, you... You know, you say in your book that it's kind of unique that you, you knew your true nature as a young person, as a child. But actually, it's, it's maybe somewhat rare, but not altogether uncommon among the people I interview. There are quite a few people I've interviewed who, re, you know, relate a similar thing. And then, mm -hmm. like, like you, they tend to lose it in their teenage years. And then, and then you know, generally among people I interview, they, they've regained it, which is why I'm interviewing them. Um, mm -hmm. And one fellow, who was also from Toronto, incidentally, said he only had a 15-minute period in his whole life where he lost his awareness of his true nature, and he said he didn't want to live, but he managed to recover it after 15 minutes. <laughs> but uh, in any case, um, I guess you, you were saying that from your earliest recollection, you knew who and what you were. Yeah, there was, there was a connection for sure. But let me just quickly uh, qualify that because mm -hmm. it, my view is that it, it happens for all human beings. We all lose it. It's yeah. just what degree and how, how long does it last. And Yeah. You think we all have it at some point during our lives? Um, or do, do, do most people come in totally blotto? You know, they've, they've lost it from birth. No, I don't think so. I think we all come in. Uh, you know, sort of still connected to source as awareness, but we're identifying with, they're learning to identify with the body. Yeah. As we do that. And the more identified we come with the body, then, you know, often what happens is as we're developing human egos, we lose all connection to true nature. Right. And do you see that as a sort of a necessary evolutionary progression that you kind of have to lose it in order to 
regain it in a in a way so as to actually be able to live it in as a human being probably as a human being for now at this stage in our evolution i don't know about the future but yeah. it seems to be the way it goes now <laughs> they say that people who who come in totally self-realized and never lose it aren't actually people they're they're avatars you know who are here for a specific purpose but the common lot tends to lose it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Now you also mentioned that um, you remembered later on in your life having chosen your parents and I've heard that before I've heard you know spiritual teachers say that we we choose our parents um, according to the the sort of karmic fit that a certain you know pair of individuals will will provide and um, you want to just elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, well, I, you know, I think it happens. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it happens for all human beings, I think, all human souls as they incarnate. Well, some people might say, I would never have chosen my parents if I had been given a choice. Or, or why would some poor soul who's born in Sudan or something choose to be born in those circumstances? What would you say to them? Well, those are those are heavy questions, right? Mm -hmm. Usually, there's there's a karmic reason for every every decision as you as you prepare for incarnation. I can't say what that would be for any particular individual, but it seems to me that that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, now I'm gonna just um, refer to some little notes I took while I was reading your book, and if I'm jumping ahead too fast, and there are things that you want to say to fill in the gaps, please just you know, contribute that. But one thing you referred to was, um, as a child, a, a sudden, a subtle vision that arose in your mind's eye every night before falling asleep. Uh, that sounded significant. What was that vision? Uh, well, it, it was, the vision itself was what I call trans, um, vehicles of transformation. These are all the, the little subtle forms that can arise as part of our inner journey. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things can happen, <clears throat> but that particular uh, form was what many traditions refer to as the divine spark. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a child and as a baby, really, uh, I was able to perceive that through my mind's eye uh, before I fell asleep every night. And what it would do was expand my beingness into both what I now call the luminous nirvana or the light of God and also uh, the formless presence that is God before manifestation. So how would you describe it? Like you say divine spark, was it just like a little glowing ball of light or something or what? Yeah, it would start a tiny uh, sort of spark off in the distance, but then as I focused on it, it would grow and expand until my entire field of awareness was and then in fact I just lost all sense of identity and merged with the light. Mm. And that would be your nightly experience as a, as a young child? Every night. Nice. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, and then would you retain that as you were sleeping or would you sort of uh, black out when you actually went to sleep? Uh, no, I, yeah, I wouldn't retain it. It would sort of be a process of expanding and becoming uh, one with this luminous dimension. And there was another part of the experience that uh, would, is what I, I referred to as a contraction phase. So I would sort of, the light would then return as a form in my mind's eye until it became just a tiny point. And uh, I myself would actually have to merge with that point and dissolve all sense of self. Hmm. And that, that would lead to uh, the formless dimension. So every night you dissolved all sense of self, merged with the formless dimension, and then went to sleep. Yeah, pretty much. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes I would, you know, it was this process of going through uh, the inner light, expanding into that, and then dissolving into the formless, and then into the light again, over and over again. I mean, it, you know, it was always wonderful. So sometimes I'd let it go for hours. Wow. Is that something that you could have described to friends back at the time? Or was it something you kind of rem remembered later on in life as having happened? Oh, I'm sure I could have tried to explain it. Yeah, I don't think it was beyond my ability to explain it, but I didn't think anyone would believe me. Yeah, but you were well aware of it and enjoyed it and welcomed it every night. Yeah, 
and I've spoken to seekers since then. It's not an uncommon experience. Mm -hmm. It does happen for people. So. Yeah. To me, that suggests that the the connection with your true nature was very lively and very strong and very clear, and that it wasn't overshadowed to a very great degree. So that even the sort of dim, dim, diminishing of sensory input that happens when we go to sleep enabled it to just kind of blossom forth um, naturally. Would that be a fair description, yeah. do you think? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it happened quite naturally. Yeah. yeah. And when you woke up in the morning, was there a similar thing where the sensory input hadn't begin to, begun to impinge upon you yet and so there was like this flood of pure awareness before you got into your day or what? Uh, in the my mornings were unique in the sense that I would I, I would also have um, uh, a state of awareness throughout sleep, particularly during dreams. So mm -hmm. you've heard people describe having the witness throughout waking, well, lucid dreams. dreaming. Yeah. So I would have that as well, and so often when I woke up, uh, or, or as I was waking up, I'd be aware that I was returning to my. Mm. this my little body you know being a person in the world but mm -hmm. i would still re uh, retain an awareness of true nature as i was uh waking up and often during that time i would i would have uh, a quick review or a scan of my dreams from the night from that night and mm -hmm. uh, just seem to naturally understood understand what they meant how they related to me huh. you know, as part of my own inner work as a kid <laughs> that's pretty neat uh, <laughs> I was going to ask you about that, um, maintaining awareness during sleep, because I have a file on my computer that's a compilation of quotes from a whole lot of different spiritual teachers and, you know, going some ancient ones and some modern ones, things from the Bible and everything else, all, all related to that very experience that um, in the awakened person, however you want to describe it, um, there is a continuity of pure awareness. Um, underlying or con or continuing throughout waking dreaming and sleeping that nothing overshadows it um, mm -hmm. you know you know that term turiya fourth right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, and waking dreaming and sleeping are the first th first three one two three yeah. and then turiya pure awareness is the fourth and it's said that once attained uh, clearly and stably that fourth state uh, is perpetual as the other three rotate around um, so I guess that you're saying that was pretty much your experience. Yeah. Yeah. And then you then you lost it during your teenage years, and then did it return? I mean, is that your your experience now, pretty much? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Not to the same degree. Hmm. Uh, there was a period where I focused on establishing that uh, the fourth state is true. Right. Tree is true, mm -hmm. and so I worked very diligently at it to uh ensure that in fact it was possible and for months i had 24-hour witnessing awareness but now i <laughs> it's not it's either it comes and goes during sleep and dreaming yeah for sure but it, it doesn't concern me all that much yeah i have friends who say something similar they say you know that that went on for years and they got to a point where they thought i'd rather just conk out you know i don't want to be awake during <laughs> you know, just to soon sleep right there's i mean there was a period where i was sleeping uh as an experiment for like 16 hours a day to see if it was possible to maintain uninterrupted immersion in the formless state mm -hmm. and finally i heard a voice which i referred to as you know the divine which is like enough already like, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, mm. There, there was a sage in the Vedic literature na called named Durga Thomas, and his whole thing was he liked to sleep. He would sleep for like six months at a time and all, but he was this great saint at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to like to sleep a, a whole lot. There, I have memories of my dad trying to wake me up grabbing. That's a brawny guy, a truck driver, and we were in. He would try to wake me up, and I just wouldn't wake up. And he would actually grab my mattress and shake it like a sheet, to try, and I would just... <laughs> like a piece of uncooked spaghetti just rolling around. I knew he was doing this, but it didn't break my sleep. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Some yogis do that with samadhi, you do it with sleep. <laughs> um, okay. Well, we're going to continue on with. Uh, well, let's let's go. Let's stick with the autobiographical a bit more before we get into some of these other points. So. Um, what, uh, what else is there that's significant to recount about your childhood years um, 
in terms of spiritual experiences, spiritual thoughts and aspirations, before you got to that point where you started to lose it and knew you were going to lose it, and we were kind of dreading and resisting the inevitable loss? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, the, you know, maybe the only thing that's really significant is that I had discovered these little ways of reconnecting whenever I felt like I was becoming a little, a little too identified with my, my uh, sense of personhood or individuality mm -hmm. or just you know being a, a person or body in the world and not feeling connected to uh, the transpersonal or, or witnessing state so I had the I discovered these little little techniques that I would use as a way to reestablish reestablish that connection uh, while I was going about my everyday life like what uh, probably the most significant one was just staring at myself in a mirror hmm. and uh, as I would do this I would uh, my my awareness would just naturally expand, uh, and, and I'd be aware more of the witness simply by just gazing at my form in the mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that would that would always lead to um, a, a total uh, immersion in beingness itself. And I would realize like being this not only am I being this, but that being this is the the source and the substance of everything in existence. And then that would be a little too overwhelming at times. I just couldn't believe that that was the truth. And I just sort of pull back and just abide in the witness. Mm. Yeah. And how old were you at this stage when you're having these realizations? Uh, four or five. I mean, it was, it was, it was there before I, I had conceptual knowledge. Yeah. As I was developing a conceptual understanding of my own experience, which happens as we develop as human uh -huh. beings, I, I would... I, I would start to understand it in a, a you know, a, a self-reflexive, uh, verbal kind of way that mm -hmm. we comment our experience. That's pretty cool. I mean, when, yeah. I, when I compare, you know, that to the kind of things I was concerned with when I was that age, you know, and during all those all those years, it's like, man, you really got a jump start. I had the same concerns too, though. Yeah. 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 I was still a boy, you know. Yeah. But it's remarkable. Um, maybe it'll become more and more common now as, as society, as the world wakes up. But I don't know, I think it's neat. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so you mentioned some techniques. Well, you said the mirror gazing. You, you said some others. I don't know if these were things you were doing in your childhood or what, like tracing back the witness, quantum gazing. Things like that. Were, was that, or, or was that stuff you developed later on? Uh, I think the quantum gazing thing was more in my teenage years, but um, tracing back the witness, which was sort of just allowing myself to shift into the uh, that observing state, I would just you know ask myself, what is the source of this? Mm -hmm. I was doing that from quite a young age. Okay. Hey, that's, it's, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you continue. Uh, that that's a form of self inquiry. I mean, everybody knows Ramanas, but uh, the main method or technique that I teach people is simply that to sort of uh, allow yourself to get in touch with the witness, and then as you're abiding in that, probe deeper into what is the source of this witnessing. Mm -hmm. That leads to okay. uh, beingness, the fullness of beingness, true nature. Mm. I mean, we can call it many different things. Um, a question just came in from Jan Essman uh, from Copenhagen, whom I've interviewed a couple of times actually. And he said, uh, if he was experiencing the witnessing that is associated with self-realization, he would experience dreamless sleep as bliss. Is or was that your experience? Uh, bliss? Not as much. It was, you know, more peace, mm -hmm. equanimity. Um, but, you know, there was definite bliss during the light. Yeah, you did mention a stage at which you didn't even dream. I, I, that might have been later on after your big awakening at 22, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk more about that and about bliss. Um, but let's let's dwell a bit more on on the witness thing. Um, I know that you do have you do kind of advocate um, witnessing as a practice, and. Um, I must admit that I have a sort of an ingrained bias that was kind of drilled into my head by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who was my teacher for many years. Um, he was really emphatic 
that witnessing is not something one does or should try to do, that a, a sort of an attempt at witnessing will divide the mind, and that witnessing is actually more of a quality of awakened consciousness where the, there's a natural contrast between the silence of pure awareness and the dynamism of activity, and that you don't have to do it any more than you do being clean after having taken a shower. You know, you just sort of, it's a natural condition that just is with you or it's not. And that he kind of cautioned against trying to do anything because he said it would divide the mind and make you less effective in activity and sort of create an inner strain. But you do advocate, you know, some sort of practice to try to culture or develop the witness. So maybe you could help me reconcile that, um, that discrepancy. I, I think what he's, he's describing can happen. Mm -hmm. You can sort of set up a mental position where you think, oh, I'm observing my mind, so this is the witness, but really you're just dividing the mind between uh, a, a sort of uh, partial ab amount of your awareness, which is now looking uh, or attempting to see what's arising. Yeah, because when you say witnessing, you don't mean some little part of you over here is witnessing the rest of you over there. You, you mean a contrast between the unboundedness, which is your true nature, and, and anything in the relative world, right? Yes, yeah. but in, in terms of understanding the dynamics of this, like from a, from a psychological perspective, you have awareness, I have awareness, we all have awareness. Mm -hmm. So although, you know, there are things we can do to... to uh, think that we're getting in touch with our own awareness. We can get in touch with our own awareness. You can do it now. I can do it now. Mm -hmm. And so the, the 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 process or the technique of connecting uh, with the witness is to actually abide in awareness. And at first, you're just aware, and you're like, oh, okay, so yeah, great, I'm aware. That's not a big deal. But if you don't, if you don't, if you say, if you let that pass, the sort of the um, the dissatisfaction with the the, the non the non significance of the fact that you have awareness and actually continue to keep your attention on your own awareness, it naturally expands into the witness. Yeah, here's a passage from your book. You said uh, subjectively, it felt like my identity was dividing into two parts: an impersonal side on the one hand, and my personal sense of self on the other. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is the experience when you connect with the witness. Right sort of zoom back or you know zoom up or zoom out you know and and you then realize that you have a body but you're not a body you have your mind but you're not just your mind but there's something about us that is bigger than our own uh personal selves in the world yeah and that's by its nature at least at one stage of our experience not involved in activity right it's our beingness. It's our beingness, really. yeah. It's, we were human beings, so the human part is the doing part, and the being is the part that is inactive, yeah. 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 It's, the, it's, the, it's the bird on the tree in the, that, that you punish on. One bird flits about, and the other one sits idly. Right. Chandogya, yeah. I think. And, and there are a lot of verses in the uh, Gita, too, about this, how, you know, in acting and sitting and walking and standing and drinking and whatever, one maintains, I do not act at all. And, and that's, that's not an attitude that's being advocated. That's a, a kind of a natural, spontaneous experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Nat natural, natural and spontaneous, but also not uh, obtainable through actual techniques. Right, that's the point I was trying to make, that if, if you're kind of going through your day trying to sort of manipulate your experience and get into this witness state, I, I'm just not sure how advisable that would be. Um, but it may be a condition that after a certain amount of spiritual development you find yourself in naturally. Yeah, yeah. that's why I, I, tell, I tell all my you know, students, listeners, whatever, anyone that wants to hear me talk about this stuff, that that's the importance of meditating at the beginning of the day. And if you meditate properly and you can drop into beingness, it, you're naturally going to witness. Yeah. You may not maintain it throughout your day, but I'm telling you, it's going to emerge. Right. It's and more, over time, it'll there. stabilize and become more clear. In time, it does. This is the case for most people that are on the path, I think. Yep. Yep. And um, also, would you agree that as interesting as this whole witnessing thing is, it actually is a stage? It's not sort of the ultimate state of development. Yeah, what is that, the ultimate state? <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> well, we'll get, we'll get on to that a little bit. It's, but. An important, it's an important part of spiritual development. Right. For sure. Yeah. It's when the soul finally comes online, in a way. Yeah. Until that point, you know. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, flipping back to your childhood a little bit. Um, you mentioned also, in addition to this thing that would happen when you would go to sleep, um, you know, there was a stage at which subtle beings would would kind of visit you, and um, there was one that you actually felt like, in a way, was a representation of the devil. And, and as a child, you saw it as the the, the count from Sesame Street. Um, <laughs> and then there were, in addition to that guy, sort of tempting you and trying to entice you to, you know follow him in order to gain certain abilities. There were these, this may sound far out to people, but I think it's worth discussing, and they're going to find it in your book anyway. There were these sort of gargoyles that were like, almost like bats hanging upside down that you felt had a, a protective function. So whenever this, the, the Sesame Street guy showed up, they would also show up and kind of watch over you. Um, so just that, so that, you know, doesn't blow people's minds too much, maybe you should elaborate on that situation a little bit. Now, how do I convince people that I'm sane? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just don't start trying to pick bugs out of the air and we'll be convinced. Um, you know, this, in our, in, in our contemporary culture, when we hear stuff like this, we, we have a hard time understanding it from anything other than a psychological perspective. Mm -hmm. And from a psychological perspective, it can only be understood as manifestations of the mind, the imagination. So mm -hmm. it gets, that's it. Whatever whatever you think it is, it's not that. It's just your, your childhood imagination. Oh, you were dreaming, don't worry about it. But my own understanding of the spiritual path and of that that actual experience is, is occult. And uh, there are occult phenomena. And I encountered an occult phenomena as a child. Yeah. Yeah. And there are, so there, I mean, look, there are not just, you know, uh, negative forces, there are positive forces, All positive right. and negative beings as well, mm -hmm. subtle beings, and some of them tempt us and some of them help us. Yeah, well, I've, I've brought up this point many times in interviews, on, I've even devoted whole panel discussions to this topic, um, because I feel, even though it, it sort of puts some people off, I feel like we ought to really know the story, you know, we ought to know what's going on, and I feel that, um, for many reasons, that there are, as you said, there's a whole realm, many realms uh, in creation, which are heavily populated with all sorts of subtle forms of life, and, you know, it's common for us to encounter those on the spiritual path. The, the spiritual liter is, literature is full of such encounters, so we might as well gain some understanding of it and not just pretend it doesn't exist, because it doesn't fit our philosophical viewpoint at the moment. That's right, yeah. And there, there is a, a, a connection between, you know, madness and mystical awareness and development. That, that, whole, that whole zone is part of that. I mean, you know, schizophrenic individuals aren't necessarily just having uh, aberrant thoughts. There could be beings and forces that are interrupting and interfering with their, their cognitive functions. Yeah, they could even be not only... And, and those beings may not be unbeknownst to them. They may perceive them and see them, and everybody just thinks they're crazy and gives them Thorazine, but they could actually be opened up to stuff, you know, astral realms and so on, and yet not have the capacity to deal with it, not have the inner strength or whatever it takes. That's right. That's right. And, and you know, a large part of those beings are, are from what Aurobindo referred to as the intermediate zone. Mm-hmm. They're sort of uh, half, you know, half realized, half corrupted beings all throughout the universe. <laughs> yeah. And you can encounter them and oftentimes they, you know, they want to, they want you to follow them. There's a desire to have you follow and listen to them, but they're not immersed in the truth completely. And mm -hmm. so what he said is that you can still learn from them, but, you know, there, it's, a, it's a realm of half lights and half truths and it's all mixed. Yeah. Yeah. Patanjali talks about this in the Yoga Sutras. He actually says that at a certain stage you may be tempted by certain celestial beings or whatever, and, and they kind of try to allure you with certain promises, or and you should just like you know say thanks but no thanks and <laughs> move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's a it, it's an important distinction because the the most important uh, part of spiritual development 
at least in my understanding. And, and although this view isn't necessarily as accepted or it's sort of going through some kind of debate debate in, in spiritual conversations, uh, the, you know, the whole point of the spiritual path is to awaken to the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. And so that's why in many traditions, you know, they, they sort of say, never mind all of that visionary stuff, move past that because it's all a distraction at this point. Uh, until you get established in your own true nature, don't worry about any of that stuff. But then afterwards, you know, um, you begin to distinguish between benevolent beings and malevolent ones. And, and, and on the path, the benevolent ones can certainly be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, Mar to reference Maharishi again, he always used to use this example of a, a, a territory which had all kinds of interesting things in it, diamond mines and gold mines and stuff. And then the, 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 there was a fort at the center of the territory commanding it. And he said that it might be tempting to go after this diamond mine or that di gold mine, but what you really should do is capture the fort because then the territory will belong to you. Then you can explore it at your leisure safely without getting, you know, in... A, a dicey situation because you're you're venturing into something that you have no command over. That's right. Or, orders from headquarters. Yeah. That's my catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So while we're still on this point, um, you just said that you felt like these subtler beings, some of them anyway, could be helpful on our path. And it's worth throwing into the mix here that, you know, there's not only the sort of astral level, which is still relatively gross, but there's a celestial level, which is more refined, much closer to the absolute level. And uh, in what way would you say that, you know, these subtler impulses of intelligence, which are functional in the universe, if you, uh, could be helpful to human spiritual development? Uh, they're always helping us. Mm -hmm. You know, or trying, anyways. That's that's part of I think their divine purpose. Yeah. But if we open up to this possibility at, at a certain stage in your own spiritual development or just curiosity, maybe maybe the religious religious people aren't all wrong. <laughs> you sort of like maybe they've got something. Uh, they've discovered something beneficial here, and you yeah. open up to it, and you invite that influence in. Yeah. Miracles upon miracles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the New Age people are always talking about, you know, ascended masters and guardian angels and, you know, spirit guides and, and all this stuff. And um, I guess, you, you know, you still have to have, the, have a little caution, you know, when you, when you say invite something in, that has a little bit scary connotations. But, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you, you, you kind of want to keep a balance, I think, and not just you know, dismiss out of hand all of this stuff as, as hogwash. Uh, on the other hand, don't just sort of be undiscriminating and open and anything goes and I'll invite whatever comes along. It's like, I don't know, there's just sort of this balancing thing. That's spiritual maturity, and uh, you know, a lot of New Age people don't necessarily have it, and they hook into this stuff, and you know, again, they get they get trapped in the intermediate zone. <laughs> yeah. 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 Safety first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so as you got a little older, you realized, <clears throat> you know, that you were going to have to disconnect from this formless dimension that had been so predominant during your younger years. And um, you're just going to have to become a wild and crazy teenager for a while. And uh, you said that there was actually something intentional you did to precipitate this. You, you began breathing from your upper chest rather than the belly. Want to talk about that a little? Yeah, well, one of those uh, little techniques that I had discovered when I was uh, <clears throat> a young, uh, young kid growing up was to uh, really focus on breathing and I naturally breathe fully, which is what we learn in yoga to, you know, to have full breath. And so by breathing into my belly, I would dissolve into first my own sense of beingness as an individual, but then from, from there, from the belly center into beingness itself. So that was another technique that I used. And I knew that I had to give up my connection, so I dropped all my practices. And it was that one in particular that I focused on deliberately not doing by only breathing into the upper part of my chest as a way to forget about the absolute truth. Mm. But I stopped all the other practices, tracing back the witness, looking in the mirror. Um, those are the two main ones. Uh, and, mm. and the deep breathing. 
Yeah, and you actually became agnostic then for a period of yeah. years. Yeah. So it's interesting because most people that I've spoken with who felt like they had you know some de degree of awakening during childhood really didn't want to lose it, and they they kind of did everything they could to prevent themselves from losing it. But you, it seems like you realized. It's like you walked willingly into the fire, like you realize that I'm going to have to go through this phase and all right, I'm shutting it down. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying not to be so extreme as I mature as a human being. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the case anyway. Yeah. That was the case. Yeah. I mean, that was also, I think that was just the way it unfolded for me and it was something I knew I had to do and uh, it was, it was, you know, sort of demarcated by a very, uh, time-bound sort of event like it happened I knew it was gonna happen that it had to happen and I said okay well let's do this completely for you know my dad you know sort of maybe had some I don't know uh, influence here but you know don't do anything half fast if you're gonna do it do it all in <laughs> <laughs> all right I'm gonna... there, I don't know yeah that's funny yeah. Um, so how many years did you go in that phase of being kind of shut down uh, four or five, sort of, about till about sixteen or seventeen. Oh, that's not too bad. No. Yeah. Um, and then what? What was it that began to egg you to to you know waking up wake, wake up again? What What was Was there some like little voice inside that said it's time to remember? Uh, well, yes, but it it happened after uh, having my heart broken. Oh, uh, <laughs> romantic breakup or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, I was with a girl and uh you know, it uh it was uh a, a real good learning uh experience. I didn't waste time uh exploring human sexuality either. So, uh when that ended, my my delusions ended very quickly. Hmm. So I'd sort of been in a way at, at, at the very young age of 15 or 16, sort of um, broken down huh. by, this, so, by, this, by this tumultuous romantic sexual relationship. Yeah. And that, that, that prompted me to realize, okay, now you have to get it back. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. What do you mean you yeah. didn't waste time exploring human sexuality? You mean you were in this sexual relationship when you were 15, 16, and then the girl broke up with you, and so it didn't, you didn't get to explore it that long or something? And no, no, I did everything. We, it was like I, I experienced the full, like all, all you could possibly experience in a relationship, all the insanity of it. I experienced all of that. Uh -huh. yeah. You just compacted it into a short That's period right. of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so you went through all that, and then, and at the tail end of that, you thought, there's got to be more. And, oh yeah, there's that spiritual thing that I forgot about four or five years ago. That's right. Huh. Yeah. So that, that, that reignited my, my, my journey as a seeker again. It mm. reignited, made it the so, central focus of my life from that point on. Yeah. So what sort of things did you do to, you know, as a seeker to, to get, get the train rolling again? Well, I, w I was really asking myself all of those spiritual questions that we ask as teenagers, I think, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it sort of coincided with that. Like, what's the purpose of life? Why am I here? Why are we here? What's the meaning? Is there meaning? All of that. And so it was really um, a search to, to find the answers to those questions, not really realizing that the answers to those questions were uh, states of being mm. that I had lost touch with and, and had forgotten how to get back in touch with them. Mm -hmm. And did you start doing various kinds of practices again? I had no idea about spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. Not really. So you're just seeking intellectually yeah. and emotionally. Yeah. So yeah. I think, I'm pretty sure this is before the internet, so... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like what you could find at your local library. Yeah. And yeah. you mentioned that you somehow realized the importance of selfless service and, and started doing a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, that became, as I sort of got going with the, the search, the inquiry into the answer to these questions, I, I began to have experiences again. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one, of those, one of those was uh, discovering that engaging in selfless service 
kind of gets rid of your own personal uh, desire for satisfaction from life and that uh, getting that out of the way and realizing that if you just give yourself to others, you actually gain your true self. That's what I did all the time. Cool. What forms of service did you do? Just everyday stuff. You know, like uh, if I uh, I was I put myself through high school and university, I worked as a, a waiter mm -hmm. at a restaurant uh, up here in Canada. I don't know if you have them down there. We have a, a restaurant called Swiss Chalet. It's a oh rotisserie chicken place anyways it's uh <laughs> i still i still enjoy it from time to time <laughs> it's pretty good anyway at work predominantly i would you know uh help my fellow employees i clear their tables for them without being asked uh the drivers in the back if they or anyone needed my car i just throw them the keys take it don't give me back any i don't want anything in return i just wanted to do things for other people so mm. i did whatever it didn't matter mm. Pour them, uh, re get their coffee, light their cigarette, like this, whatever. Mm -hmm. Whatever somebody needed, I would try to to, to provide it. Yeah. yeah. And you felt that that was sort of uh, effective in helping to attenuate your ego and your sense of self importance or something. Yeah. 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 It was yeah. good practice. It's still to this day I do it. Yeah. All the, yeah. And as I'm sure most people know, that, you know, this is considered to be an important thing. and all forms of spirituality, really Eastern and Western. Um, they call it seva in Sanskrit, and I'm sure that in Christianity there are words for it and certainly examples of it. Um, it's kind of a time-honored method of, of helping to diminish self-centeredness, you know, and, and put one and, more, more in service of the divine. Yeah, and, and awaken the soul. Yeah. It puts you in touch with the soul. Mm -hmm. and, and from the soul you get more uh, you know, accurate intel, better orders from headquarters. Yeah. <laughs> so um, from the time you, I guess you're 15 or 16, you, you kind of got on the seeker train again, and then you had your big awakening at 22. So that's about, you know, seven or six or something years. years. And um, w was there like a, a lot of intensity during that whole period? Like, you know, whatever this is, I got to get it or I'm not going to... I can't stand living like this. I've got to achieve. Um, and you know what? I mean, you mentioned the last few months prior to your awakening was one long, long dark night of the soul. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, so what was going on during those years? Uh, yeah, there was an intensity. Um, you know, I was also going through all kinds of, you know, uh, transformations, inner transformations, changes as we do, uh, mm -hmm. just being a human being. But mm -hmm. uh, as part of those, I was uh, getting back in touch with certain realizations, but it, it wasn't connected to an understanding of the absolute truth. So I was moving in and out of the witness, but I had no idea what the witness was. That's why I felt sort of disassociated. I'm, you have to remember, I'm a, I'm a materialist. I'm an agnostic at this <laughs> point. And as far as the world is concerned, I'm disassociating. Mm. That can't be good, you know, uh, what's happening? Yeah. <laughs> Am I becoming, you know, schizoid? So you're trying to make sense of your experience. And so what was the nature of this dark night of the soul that you were in for a few months before your awakening? I was sort of based upon, <clears throat> so part of, you know, going through these changes of state and not really understanding them, there was some confusion and, and um, along with the confusion, uh, depression, mm -hmm. um, because of not knowing, not understanding, and not feeling very grounded. Uh, I was also at uni in university and uh, it was quite challenging. The first mm -hmm. two years often are yeah. very challenging, so there was that. Um, I was, you know, as a result of the witness uh, emerging and me not really understanding it and sort of being dissatisfied too with my own uh, life and lack of knowing, uh, I began to suffer from what we call existential uh, ennui or, you know, the sense of like nothing matters, yeah. which is a, you know, can be a universal experience. And I'm sure you've come across accounts of people having that feeling of mm -hmm. not understanding and then being very uh, dissatisfied with conventional life and knowing that there has to be more, but not understanding what that more is. Yeah. So it was that. It was like that. Yeah. 
that's, I think, you know, I mean, I, I don't know what the percentages are, but there are a large percentage of the U.S. population and probably the Canadian is on Prozac and Zanfel, or Zantac or whatever these drugs are called, you know, that try to provide some kind of solace because they feel so miserable. <laughs> uh, so I think a lot of, it's kind of almost universal that people don't feel satisfied, whether they're still thinking <coughs> that they're going to get satisfaction from the relative world or have given up hope to, uh, in doing that. There's a lot either, of... <laughs> either yeah. way. Yeah. Either like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is this really what it is? is this, how come I'm not happy? Yeah. I mean, this, this, is, this is perennial. Yeah. But this is just how it's showing up in the in the modern world and people are medicating. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I have a little passage here that you wrote about the, the moment of your enlightenment, um, but is there anything, which I could read, just a few sentences, but is there anything um, you want to say about the events leading up to that moment that would be interesting for people to hear? Well, let's hear what you want to read and then maybe we can. Okay, so here's what you wrote. Uh, you said, every, every remnant of my personal identity was gone, obliterated. It was like amnesia, but even that fails to convey the sense of emptiness fully. It felt like I'd never existed. There was nothing. No more life, no more memories, no more me. Nothing. All that remained was my disembodied awareness and this endless realm of nothingness, a vacuum devoid of any features, forms, or qualities. No formless bliss, no absolute truth, nothing. So you sort of you fell into this void, apparently, yeah. and you, you kind of identify that as the big watershed moment. Yeah, I mean, that was part, uh, yeah, that's part, that was part of the, uh, the transformations that I was experiencing on the night of my awakening, but uh -huh. there were, yeah, there were definitely, as you read in my autobiography, yeah. there were things that happened or occurred before that and as well as after that. Why don't you fill us in a little bit? Tell us about some of those things. Um, <clears throat> My wife told me to prepare for this question. <laughs> well, you wrote a book about it. <laughs> I, I, so, and she said, and don't tell people to read the book. You have to be, pre you have to be prepared to, you know, give them the details. Uh, so I'll do my best. Okay. Um, well, let's just move, move from there. Uh, as, as I, <clears throat> on the night of my awakening, sort of what, what was occurring was, uh, I'd sort of, I don't know where to start. Um, probably just sort of, I, I'm, I'd spent the evening out with a friend and I, you know, I, something happened, we went to a bar and something happened at the bar that sort of got me really turned off with wanting to be out, out at all anymore. And I'm suffering from, you know, uh, existential, uh, anxiety and ennui and all of this. So I just wanted to go home. I went home. <clears throat> and it was really cold that night, as I recall. It was, yeah, it was a cold night. Some sometime in the middle of January. I'd just gotten back from uh, Florida with my girlfriend. My mom had bought me uh, a ticket to go because she knew that I was sad. <laughs> she wanted to send me to Florida to try to help me get happy again because she didn't understand what was going on. Uh, and I came home that night uh, and there was a, a, an intensified longing for, you know, a final resolution to my search. I wanted to understand the answer to the questions that I had about life and meaning and purpose and all of this. What am I here? Why are we here? And uh, I, I, I went into the house. I ended up sitting on the couch and just sinking back into the witness. And from there, got the impulse to get up and go to the base. I had a, uh, a room in the basement of my, uh, my, my parents' house at the time and to go into the basement, which was pitch black <clears throat> and uh, lie on my bed. And I sort of felt something kind of big was about to happen, but I didn't, again, I didn't really have any conceptual understanding for any of this. So I didn't really know what was going on, but something was going on. And um, I felt, uh, in my room as I was sort of uh, sinking more and more fully into the witness, I felt this presence actually come into my room. Uh, and that it sort of enveloped the entire space. And the presence 
had this quality of the voidness that you just described and it said you know if you want to find the answer to your quest you have to uh, let go and become what you're feeling emanating all around you and I I was terrified <laughs> I didn't I didn't want you know I wasn't sure what was going to happen and so I was sort of apprehensive and then uh, I had a, a a subtle vision arise in my mind's eye uh, of a of a vortex just sort of opened up in my mind's eye and i felt from that unfathomable presence in my in my dark in the darkened space of my bedroom sort of urging me like go into that and i wasn't sure what would happen if i did but felt like this is pretty significant and i know i i'm not getting the answers any other way so i'll let myself dissolve into into this vortex and as soon as I did that that's when what you described happened I mm -hmm. sort of my entire sense of self was obliterated it, it was shattered in a, in a kind of a, a psychological shamanic uh, dismemberment it wasn't bodily but it was psychological my entire sense of self was obliterated and uh, dissolved into that void and as I was in that void I thought oh this you know this is a mistake. This can't be the absolute truth. There's nothing here. Mm -hmm. And am I going to have to stay here in this? Like, if so, like, I'm, I'm done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've made some kind of cosmic spiritual error, and I'm just going to have to sit in this limbo like uh, place of, of void and nothingness. It was like a limbo without any any indication of ever getting out. But that now I understand that that is a part of the, the transformation that we can even go through during meditation, but was more uh, confabulated during this experience. And it was out of that voidness that I then was brought into a state of unity with the, the, the formless plenum, the fullness of that emptiness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's sort of this interesting collection of terms that are used in uh, spiritual literature, Vedic and otherwise, about you know, whether it's a fullness or an emptiness. You know, the Buddhists talk a lot about emptiness, and certain v Vedic or Hindu uh, texts talk about fullness, pranamada, pranamidam. And mm -hmm. um, Marsh used to talk about it both ways. He would talk of fullness of emptiness and fullness of fullness. Um, mm -hmm. So I suppose it just there can be different flavors to that experience and, and different understandings. I mean, I, would you say maybe it could be thought of as empty since there's nothing, no thing there to be found, and yet it's full in the sense that it's the sort of, the, it's the field of all possibilities. It's the source of, of all manifestation. Every, everything exists there in seed form. Yeah, that's all part of it. It's flavors and it's also stages. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are facets and stages of it. Right. So you went through this thing. It was the evening. It was cold. And and then what? Just go to sleep and wake up in the morning, or did you? <laughs> was, was there more like, oh my God, what what has happened to me? And you sat up half the night coming to terms with it. Uh, no, I mean the the experience sort of uh, finished off, and mm -hmm. I, I realized that I'd brought into been brought into a state of, uh, you know, reconnection with source and with my own true nature. And uh, <clears throat> so that was good. It turned out good at that point. And <clears throat> um, it was at that point, so I, I was sort of, you know, immersed in the bliss of the formless mm -hmm. and also all kinds of uh, realizations about the significance of the formless, how it's a part of uh, a necessary part of manifestation mm -hmm. all kinds of realizations were occurring as i was uh immersed in it and i i there was a uh, again that a voice from that presence that said okay you know do you want to stay here or do you want to go back to your life and i thought well I'll, I'll go back to my life i felt pretty confident that i had rediscovered the, the absolute truth that i had been searching for and i understood it by becoming it and so uh, I decided to come back. And when I came back, uh, that and that process of actually deciding to return to my my body, my mind, my my sense of uh, self as an individual, uh, went through a transformation that 
completely changed m my psychological makeup and also my understanding of who I was as both an individual and also uh, as more than an individual. Yeah, when you describe that in the book, it, it actually sounds like a near-death experience. You say, I remember being in this same dimension prior to incarnating, which is when I recalled undergoing the after the afterlife phenomenon known as a life review. So it, it's, it sounds like you actually went through some kind of life review even right there in the basement as you were deciding to come back, right? That's right, yeah. It was, it was a, a full-on you know, psycho-spiritual conversion mm -hmm. with, with elements of near-death experience, uh, you know, visionary experiences were part of it, mystical. Uh, formless dissolution. So there was, you know, it happened. It, it, the, the entire experience lasted about ten minutes, but there was there were many features, many components to it, mm -hmm. and the near death experience that that I subsequently read about as part of my own, you know, research. I realized, oh, I, I that was part of my awakening. I actually yeah. went through a near death experience, and also understood uh, that human beings go through the exact same process at the end of life: a return to the void which can be very disorienting if you don't understand it, as I was disoriented. Mm. But that's only a preparation to then uh, go through the life review. Mm -hmm. So we have to completely lose our, 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 our life, the life that we lived in a way. We have to completely let it go or drop it in order for, in order for us to extract the wisdom that we're supposed to out of it mm -hmm. as we go through that process. And so did that kind of happen to you? It's like you you transcended so utterly that you had pretty much dropped your life almost almost like dying but your body wasn't dying and and you so because it was so complete it put you through a life review yeah i went i went through a total life review yeah completely and the way i, I you re, i don't know if you recall but in the book i describe it the way that it happened which was I, I sort of had 360 degree vision and i was just looking uh through all of these screens uh, at the same time, just getting replays of my entire life. Hmm. Sometimes people talk about their entire life flashing before their mind's eye. I had that, but on multiple screens all around me, hmm. and all at once. And I just didn't resist. I accepted the truth of it all. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't always pretty. Right. Did you feel like you learned a lot from it? Like, you know, I was, a, I was a schmuck here, or I was a good guy there, and, you know, that kind of thing. All of that, all of that. Yeah. But it's stalled. It was, it's incomprehensible, in a way, to think mm -hmm. about how much I understood, because, you know, we go through life, and we have experiences, and we learn from them. But it was like that. Do you feel you know, like it really had a function or a purpose that, that changed the way you um, operated thereafter? Yeah, yeah. Well, my entire, yeah, my entire life was changed at that point. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned that um, you, you completely s changed a lot of things. I mean, you, you became a vegan or something, you lost a whole lot of weight, you stopped smoking, I guess you had been smoking, and um, you know, there's a picture of you in your book, you know, you're all skinny and, and bright looking. It's like you completely, your friends thought maybe you had anorexia or something, but you, you completely rebooted your system. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Or it got rebooted and I just didn't, you know, I just did what I had to do to, you know, make sure that the install <laughs> stayed. Yeah. I think I remember you saying something, though, that it was like you felt like, you know that saying from the Bible about not pouring new wine into old wineskins? It's, it's almost like you felt like this vehicle needs some house cleaning before it's fit to hold this new awareness and therefore I'm going to radically clean house. Yes, it did. And I did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You, you mentioned in the book that your your whole sort of orientation of your your self changed. You said that the location of my new self was no longer in my body. Instead, it hovered mysteriously above your he above my head. Mm -hmm. So you felt like you were kind of like hovering up there, just viewing your life from you know yeah. a few feet above your head or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. sort of like it, you're in, in the zone, like athletes sometimes get in the zone and they have that perspective and it allows them to control the game, really. Yeah, and that was that, going on that, all the time? Yeah, for about three years. Hmm. Yeah. And so that's what you mean when you say it was going on for about three years. That's what you mean by you were kind of in, the tr in a transcendental state of awareness um, and you needed to eventually come down from that or embody. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. We all do. I mean, this is, you know, this is also something that's being understood more and more, I think, in the contemporary spiritual world that mm -hmm. awakening isn't just a transpersonal experience. We, we can, it, you've heard about people that have these experiences and they do mm -hmm. transcend. And you'll hear teachers refer to the body and the mind. Right. They're talking about themselves, yeah. but in the third person, because they're fully immersed in, in the transcendent perspective. But as part of spiritual maturation, as I understand it, then it has to become embodied. Yeah, I've interviewed a woman named Jack O'Keefe, and she, I don't know if she's still doing this, but she always used to refer to herself as the Jack character. And, mm -hmm. and, and this, this used to drive another friend of mine crazy. We, I did a panel discussion with them uh, at the SAND conference, and the other friend is Francis Bennett, and he was saying, why are you calling yourself the Jack character? <laughs> it's just like there's a sort of detached implication, you know, to using a phrase like that with, to refer to oneself that you know, he couldn't relate to. Yeah, 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 well, you know, I'm sure you met some friends that, you know, referred to themselves in the third person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a different thing, anyway. Yeah, and yet yeah, during this whole trend, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. What you no, that, I mean, it could be irritable because, you know, sometimes your friends might, you know, the Steve-O or whatever. Yeah. But I think, you know, Keith's uh, experience, it's still, you know, it's still at that transcendental stage of realization where it really, I mean, this is my, this is me, but it's not me. Right. You know? And yet, you know, you weren't a space cadet. You, you, you were in this transcendental state for about three years, but you were going to school, you were working as a mediator, you were even planting thousands of trees. I, I believe that was in that same stage, which was a physically demanding job. You'd be out in the bush, you know, planting even a couple of thousand little trees a day and, you know, commuting long hours on a bus and all this stuff. And yet you say you were in a kind of a detached, transcendental, aloof state during all that. Yep. Yep. Did, did people regard you as being transcendental and aloof, or did it seem like you were pretty integrated? Uh, maybe aloof. Yeah. Maybe but aloof. Dispassionate, but I maybe? I don't, I don't think they understood or, or had any way of knowing that, you know, my, the, the seat of my consciousness wasn't in my body. Mm -hmm. How would they? Yeah. I think they, they definitely, people would pick up on the aloofness quality. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't completely aloof either. I was still... Uh, very personable, but at, at that point it was similar. My own experience was similar to Jackie O'Keefe's. It was just the character <laughs> responding to people. Yeah. Who need response because my body has to continue functioning in the world, and it has to do what it has to do and take care of the things it has to take care of. And not and and also just because you, you said I was engaged in all of these other activities, all of that was optimized in a way. Mm -hmm. You know. Optimized meaning it was performed efficiently. Very efficiently. Yeah. It almost sounds like you had the perspective of a puppeteer or something, you know, above your body, you yeah. know, and the body's sort of functioning, but you're not really the, the, the doer or the, the chooser. Well, we can get into that. Okay. But yeah, <laughs> I was above. Yeah. And, 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 and that's where the real chooser is and the real doer. Yeah, yeah. Huh, interesting. But then at a certain point after about three years, you felt like for whatever reason you were prompted or you decided or whatever, that it was time to integrate. That's right. right. And um, you, I don't know if, where this quite is in the, in the sequence of things, but you say in your book, um, during my waking state, I was plagued by ancient fears and primitive reactions to life and countless nights were spent fighting sadistic and tormented beings in recurring nightmarish dreams. Was, it, was that kind of during the reintegration phase or what? Yeah, that was, but that was part of uh, a deeper process that I engaged in. I, I had agreed to engage in, in a way, as part of my, my own unfolding. So m most people, the, you know, as they reintegrate with the body from a transcendental perspective, they just have to come back into the body mm -hmm. and, and learn how to become uh, sensitive, feeling, normally functioning human beings. So that was the main purpose, but I also did some deeper uh, spiritual work as part of the same process of descending. So when I descended, I didn't come back actually into my body. I went past it down into a deeper level. Hmm. 
Is that is that related this, to this is, this is an occult thing? This is very occult. What happened at this point? Yeah, we can get a little occult. Um, yeah. Is that related to what you say here? At more advanced stages of spiritual evolution, the overall karmic inheritance of humanity is confronted and transcended. It can be. Yeah. Is that why you were having all this sort of nightmarish stuff? You were taking That's on crazy. the collective karma or something? It sounds crazy, but yeah. No, it doesn't sound crazy at all. And. Um, it's, okay. it's something that I've been hearing periodically for decades that, you know, once we've cleaned up our own shit, so to speak, then, then we take on the, the humanity shit and yep. we become yes. a washing machine for that. I've heard you use that analogy. Yeah, we do. I mean, to live as a self-realized or some, somewhat realized human being in the world, you, 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 you become a sensing, uh, heart-centered, but clear individual and you take on, you feel other people. <laughs> you kind of take it on. Yeah. No. That's how we. That's how we end up existing. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of people have said that to me. That, in fact, you know, Marshy said that in 1970. Someone asked him, "Oh, what happens when we get rid of all of our own stress?" They used to call it stress. You know, the vasanas, the impressions, the the gunk clogging us up. And he said, "Then you start taking on cosmic stress." That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Cosmic and personal. Yeah. Really. Hmm. Um. Well, this might be a good point at which to throw in a couple of questions that people have asked. Um, a couple of questions, a couple of people asked about uh, free will, and um, hang on a second here. So, yeah, someone named Lynn from Toronto asked about free will, and um, you mentioned in your book, The Incredible State of Absolute Nothingness that God only allows evil to exist as a necessary consequence of giving the ability of free will to beings like us. So maybe you could comment on that and, and just elaborate a bit for Lynn's sake and other listeners. Uh, okay. Um, and and let me just preface this with one more bit, which is that I've had sort of discussions about this with various people I've interviewed who don't feel we have any free will. They feel like you know, everything is automatic, we have no choice, it appears we have choice, but we don't. And they quote these scientific studies where the, the impulse to, to move your arm actually happens a few seconds before you actually move the arm, but you appropriate the ownership of it and think you've actually done it, but and there's, yeah. no, there's no choice and so on and so forth. It's, it's a sort of a, a perennial debate. But Yeah, you know. well, I think that, that is kind of connected with right brain and left brain integration and how the brain functions and, and works as a receiver for mm -hmm. consciousness. Uh, but I, the question of free will is one that often gets raised on the spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And many non-dualists say that there's no free will. Yeah, like, my, uh, own, I, my own understanding is that that view comes from the absolute perspective. Mm -hmm. From the absolute perspective, there is no free will because all of this is happening as a simultaneous manifestation of the divine in form. So it's unfolding exactly as it's meant to. Mm -hmm. But if you change your perspective and you zoom in closer into uh, what actually happens here in the world, and you look at what the experience is as a human being, we make choices all the time. Mm -hmm. Sure seems like it. Sure does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can you can choose to, you know, not take out the garbage today and leave it till next week, but then you're gonna get maggots. Or you take out the garbage and you take care of that. Like these are choices, we make choices all the time and those choices lead to uh, outcomes, right? Yeah. But from the absolute perspective, which is where I think that view comes from, you, when you get in that state, you realize that uh, everything is happening instantaneously. So how can there be a choice? But choice is, is, is programmed into the structure of the universe. Yeah. It seems to me that from the really absolute perspective, if you want to really get extreme about it, nothing ever happened. There is no universe. Therefore, there is no choice or free will. It's like, you know, but as, as soon as you acknowledge that there is a universe, then all these relative considerations come in, which you kind of have to take seriously. Yeah. There, you know, I mean, there. I, I'm sure in even the empiricists or scientific people agree that different laws operate at different levels of reality. Absolutely. So it's the same from the absolute. The the realization is that everything is happening exactly according to divine will. Mm -hmm. 
but as you as you uh, come out of that and move into the relative, you realize that well, there's actually free will is part of this great unfolding. <laughs> yeah, I heard an interesting discussion uh, of a from a panel at the Sand Conference the other day. I was listening to this, and um, they were talking about whether there's a self. And one of the panelists, who I think happened to be a physician that that studies livers and does liver biopsies and stuff like that, uh, but is also kind of a spiritual guy, um, he was saying, "Well, it's all really a matter of scale and perspective. You know, at a certain scale and perspective, um, you have a liver. At a certain other scale, it's just molecules which have no quality whatsoever of liverness. You know, and go even mm -hmm. deeper, you're down to the atoms and then the quarks and so on. There's, there's, so you could say the same with with a sense of self. You could say the same with a sense of free will. I mean, it just depends on the level that you want to tune in on and consider. Yeah, yeah, but even even at the level of a quark, let's say, there's some agency. There's a quark that wants to connect with an antiparticle, or I don't understand quantum physics as well as I used to, but there's, there's agency there, and it wants to do its job, right? And it's, so it's seeking out its complementary opposite. It's true. It has certain tendencies and proclivities and, and, and roles and functions that it... Now, some would argue, well, the quark can only do what a quark can do. It has no choice. <laughs> but, yeah. But not, they're round and round we go. And they're all making choices that are leading to, you know, all kinds of outcomes. Yeah. Some realize their full potential and some don't. <laughs> <laughs> some return back into the formless. They self-annihilate. Okay. So I think that's a pretty good coverage of the free will issue. Um, you know, the philosophers have been debating this for millennia, and we're not going to resolve it here. But I think that gives a good perspective on it. Um, just to, I'll just add, just because I, I feel like I want to say more about it. Sure. That, you know, there, we all have circumstances in life that limit our options, but we still have choice. And mm -hmm. the more the more that we understand that we have choice, and the more that we are willing to make good choices, then it seems that freedom increases, that we get better and better opportunities. Good point. It's like um, wait a minute to write something down. Um, it's like, it, it, there's a kind of a, I think, um, an analogy we could find with like growing up. You know, when you're a little child, you have no autonomy, no freedom. You're, you're kind of completely under the control of your parents. And then you get to be a, an adolescent and you have to start uh, making choices. You start gaining autonomy. You have to start cut, cutting loose from your parents. And, um, you know, and it can be kind of reckless at that point, you know, you're making all kinds of crazy decisions and then eventually, hopefully, you become a mature adult making wise decisions. But it almost seems like in the whole span of evolution, you could compare that to, uh, you know, animals who are completely in tune with, with natural law and can only behave as monkeys or zebras or whatever they are. And then mm -hmm. human, human beings who have this kind of freedom of choice and can get themselves into trouble. And then enlightened sages who are, again, completely in the lap of the divine. Um, doing its bidding, but have come full circle, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You like that analogy? Yeah, it's great. Well, that, covers, that covers everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, someone just posted a question of how do you ask a question during these interviews. Um, there's a form on the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com. If you, if you scroll down on that page, you'll see the form at the bottom of the page, and you can submit a question through that form. Um, Okay, here's a question from a guy named Patrick uh, in Gatineau, Quebec. You may know him. Um, he wants to know, can a person be happy, spiritually aligned, and maybe even enlightened without meditating, reading wisdom books, or having a metaphysical experience? If so, what is the role of effort on a spiritual path? Yeah, it can happen. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, oftentimes, at least... What I've seen is that people have awakenings. Mm -hmm. They realize it's effortless <laughs> because there's a certain effortlessness to it. it. You realize when you already are the thing that you seek that you don't have to go anywhere to get it. You just have to stop trying so hard and realize that it's already the case. All right? Yeah. You, if you really get that, you fully get it, then no, not necessarily. You don't, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> you got it. But then, uh, you know, many, many spiritual teachers have said that the, the desire for God or the desire for enlightenment is very instrumental in the likelihood of your actually realizing. Um, the, the more, Patanjali says this too, the more vehement you are in, in your intensity of desire, the, the more rapidly or quickly you're going to realize. 
Yeah. You, you being a case in point. Yeah. Any and anyone really. I yeah. mean, desire, this is the, the, the. I mean, that's the most important desire to have. If mm -hmm. you, you know. You know I mean, and with that desire, that lead that it's that desire that drives the soul to evolve hmm. more and more and more. Now, the realization of uh, the non-dual perspective of not needing to find it because you already are that. That's just one realization. That's not the full process of spiritual maturation, you know. And so you can you can have that uh, realization and just stick with it. Oftentimes, what I see happening is that people either let too many things go because they realize nothing ultimately matters, and so their lives kind of fall apart a little bit, which I don't think is advisable. Or they lose it, and then they become seekers again and they don't know why they've lost it and it's at that point that you you know have to have desire or you have to have you know practices you have to there's some discipline that's involved uh to to maintain to develop cultivate and maintain any kind of ability including spiritual abilities mm -hmm. yeah as there's that old famous saying that enlightenment may be an accident but practice makes you accident prone <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um, here's a question that came in from someone in Toronto. She said, uh, Stephen, you mentioned that as a child, your father was trying to wake you from sleep to the point of pulling a mattress out from under you or shaking it as you slept. As a child, you existed in realms outside your body. Was there any trauma in your environment that made you not want to be in your body? No. No, no, I, no it wasn't that. Yeah. Okay. It's a fair question. Uh, you know, my parents didn't have the greatest marriage, but there was a lot of love in our home. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it wasn't sort of some. Uh, you weren't trying to escape from some emotional defense mechanism to avoid the trauma of my upbringing. My upbringing was fine. Yeah, you just like sleeping. <laughs> it was pretty ideal in some ways, but no, no, no life is perfect. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to get back to some other, you know, broader issues and philosophical questions in a minute, but I'll take care of a few questions that have come in. Here's a challenging one. Uh, this is from a guy named Mark in Santa Clara, Santa Clara, California. He said, okay, you followed a vegan diet for a time, yet your restaurant, the Millwood Melt, serves tuna, ham, and bacon. Does compassion for animals slaughtered for food production figure in the awakened perspective, or is, or is it somehow a moot point? <laughs> uh... By the way, the Buddha was reputed to have died from eating rancid pork, but uh, go ahead. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's a serious question. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, I myself, I'm not vegan anymore, mm -hmm. but I was vegan for many years. I don't eat a lot of meat. Uh, meat that I do eat, I, I try to make sure that it's been raised humanely, it's organic. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all, I mean, as you become more... Uh, spiritually sensitive you realize that when you're eating uh, uh, pork let's say you're eating a fairly sentient animal yeah as opposed to a carrot right so that's the same now i understand and i'm grateful for the food that i eat i know that this is all for food mm -hmm. in a way this material the material universe and our own experience here on earth this is food <laughs> yeah it's for us to to unfold in the in the experiment of consciousness becoming the physical so uh, that's how i understand it now do you serve like um, you know organic or humanely raised uh, meat in your restaurant if possible uh yeah. It, yeah we do at times not not all the time our bread is organic it's mm -hmm. made by a church which i love but mm -hmm. you know uh by if i were to be completely organic uh what little amount of money I do make doing this, I wouldn't even be able to make that. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's just not financially possible. Fair enough. Um, they say the Native Americans, at least this is the story, used to have a sort of a reverential attitude when they killed an animal, you know, that they would thank it for its life and for helping to sustain their life. It wasn't just killing for the sake of excitement or sport or anything like that, obviously. That is, and then that is, how could you not, as you as you become sensitive to the importance of sentience, you feel that. Yeah. yeah. And we, I, I know that both my wife and I have that reverence. And when we prefer, prepare food, we prepare it with love. Mm -hmm. It's done with reverence for the food. We're not, you know, just throwing things together. 
it, it's done in a very reverential way. Yeah. Um, let's get into talking a little bit about your teaching activity. Um, you, you mentioned that the most inspiring revelation you received during the transformation you underwent in 96 is that humanity is on the verge of undergoing a collective awakening. And you, know, you yourself have seen yourself as a, an instrument in that, you're wanting to serve in that capacity to help facilitate the awakening. And um, in the intro that I read at the beginning, you mentioned, uh, let's see where you said it. Um, the main way that you do this is through the direct transmission of the enlightened state of being, which connects others with their own true nature. And a couple of people, one in particular, uh, Lynn, I believe it was, from Toronto, was asking about uh, Shaktipat, wanted you to talk about that. Um, and someone else asked, actually, also from Toronto, <coughs> maybe they've been to one of your satsangs, what if somebody who attends your satsang is basically unsure about whether a deliberately directed energy transmission from another is personally helpful for them? So maybe let's talk about Shaktipat a little and whether one's attitude is important and if one is going to get Shaktipat and what Shaktipat is for those mm -hmm. who may not know and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I try to be as clear as possible about what I'm offering before mm -hmm. people show up. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you get from Shaktipat or energy transmission is... Uh, I mean, it's really a sort of a process of resonance. I, I as the transmitter, are am, am immersing myself in being this as much as possible mm -hmm. so that that becomes amplified. And then I'm locking into you, often through the eyes, to bring you into that same state of being. People may be unprepared for that. Mm. Some people cry. Some people break down sometimes. It doesn't happen that often, and I try to be... Uh, very sensitive and, and um, almost psychic in terms of figuring out where where is the person at and what can they handle. Mm -hmm. but you know, if you if you come and you get a transmission and I and I give you a transmission, you're going to get something. What are you experiencing while you're doing this? Me personally? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's ask both. You know, what are you experiencing? How did you begin doing this? What, you know, what made you feel you could do this? How did you know you had this ability? And also, second part of the question would be, what do other people report experiencing when they're doing this with you? Mm -hmm. I, I sort of discovered it gradually, uh, in a way. I, I would sometimes notice that if I just sat uh, and manifest or, or sort of tried to amplify my own uh, connection to source mm -hmm. that people around me would sort of feel it and then sometimes just say things so authentic to me they just blurt out things so I knew something was happening so that was the first inkling that that you know that something could be transmitted received and then out of that reception a response could come mm -hmm. uh, and my own process of discovering that I could do it happened really in a more profound way shortly after I started teaching. When I began teaching, it just started happening in a pretty powerful way, which I didn't even understand really what I was doing. It would just happen. I was just meditating with the people that were in the room and some something would sort of, in a way, feel like it was taking over and allowing a flood of all kinds of energies to come through me that would pour into other people around me. Mm. Uh, and so I, I knew that this was happening. I wasn't sure that it was happening, but I felt like it was happening. And I would sort I didn't tell anybody what, that that's what I thought was happening, but I would sort of ask people, oh, what was your experience? How did you feel, you know? And it, it just developed sort of that way as, as I was sitting with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, discovering that it was occurring, and then eventually I discovered exactly how how I make myself available in the right way, so that it's a much more conscious process. Today, we were talking earlier about kind of higher beings who were, you know, instrumental in human evolution and concerned and you know wanting to foster human evolution and so on. And you know, you have these people who are channelers who say they're channeling Saint Germain or somebody like that. In the case of Shaktipat, do you feel like there's any sort of 
higher being involved that's, that's transmitting through you, or you mean, or is it more like being itself, presence, pure awareness, you know, the, the universal consciousness that you're um, providing, a, you're being like a conduit or a transmitting station or something? Yeah, yeah. Now, now it's just I feel that I'm a conduit, and okay. so I open myself up in the way that I, I now know how mm -hmm. to. But it was Jesus that showed me how to do it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there, that was the higher being. Yeah. Talk about yeah. that. Now you've opened that can of worms. You better explain yeah, it. <laughs> well, yeah, well uh, I mean, as part of the the discovery that I had the, you know, that I could be used as a vessel this way, mm -hmm. uh, that, that got precipitated by uh, a direct encounter with Jesus, Jesus's light or the light of Christ consciousness. Hmm. Okay, obvious question. How do you, how did you know it was Jesus? What did did you actually see Jesus? Um, you know, explain how that you know elaborate on what you just said. Well, it was there was a sort of a historical component to it. I knew as I was going through this process of uh, feeling like I was being visited by a luminous entity, mm -hmm. that that particular entity was Jesus, mm -hmm. the the historical Jesus. Right. But at this stage in, in, in my understanding of Jesus' development, that personal self is doesn't it, that's not even a part of the makeup anymore. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that entity, that enlightened entity exists as a function of the divine. Mm. That's an interesting point. I mean, I've had conversations with people. For instance, I had this whole conversation with Adyashanti and Susanna Marie about a year ago about the falling away of the sense of personal self. And one of the points I made was that it seems like there's all these higher beings like Ramana and Jesus and various others that, that visit people or they, they have cognitions of them, some, in some cases without ever having heard that they existed. You know, Ram, mm -hmm. Ramana has come to people who, ne who had never heard of Ramana before and then later on they see his picture on a book. And so the question was, well, if there's a complete cessation or dissolution of any sort of semblance of personal self, how is it that these people are showing up do they are they still functioning on some higher plane and one argument is that well the divine intelligence no, no they don't exist anymore in any way shape or form but the divine intelligence knows what it's doing and it it sort of creates a, an appearance of that form which later on you'll encounter on a book cover or something and uh, you know you say oh that was Ramana so mm -hmm. I mean what is your understanding of the, the, those mechanics yeah I'm not sure yeah, okay, that's a good answer. It could, it could be that way. Yeah. Or it, it, it could be that these are um, highly evolved beings who, in, in a way, knowingly continue their work on behalf of the divine. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know if it was and you. I, and I lean, more, lean more towards that understanding, even though both are true. Yeah. I think they're both true. It's a matter, again, it's a matter of scale or perspective. Mm hmm. Okay, that's one of those other interesting questions that it's fun to touch on every now and then, but I don't expect to achieve any sort of, you know, certainty or of resolution. To, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll let uh, you know when I have the whole answer. Okay, great. We'll have to do another interview then. <laughs> Maybe you can bring in Jesus and Ramana. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, um, so... Here's some other points from your, your second book that I read, Heaven on Earth, A Guide to Enlightenment and Human New Unity. Uh, it was a nice, uh, I thought, a nice roadmap of you know, stages of development and so on. Um, and uh, you said, here's one passage in which you said, every great religious tradition testifies that there is one experience that towers above all others as the ultimate spiritual goal, traditionally called enlightenment. And you kind of referred to your awakening at the age of 22 as enlightenment, and yet you went through all kinds of stuff afterwards, you know, uh, continued growth and, and adjustment and integration and purification and so on. And it's because of that that I, I, I hesitate to use the, the term enlightenment, and a lot of people hesitate. It, it has this kind of static superlative quality to it, that implies that you're done, there's nothing more. And yet for you, even after that experience, there was a heck of a lot more, and, and there's, still, there's still stuff going on. So, mm. you know, mm. I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, you know, enlightenment is really just when the soul comes online. Okay, you know. if that's how we want to define the word. Yeah. Yeah. But, 
the experience of merging with the absolute often does lead to a, a, com a complete cessation of all other activity. I mean, Ramana, how long did he sit and do nothing? Oh, years. Right? Yeah. It can happen. Uh -huh. But then he, you know, ended up getting help and then he became, you know, a, a teacher and uh, a server of people and so he can, you know, and I'm, I'm sure it sounds like also as he became more um, identified with the particular body that he inhabited, he also became more compassionate, more loving. Like it seemed like he, as he matured throughout life uh, from a younger uh, awakened soul to an older one, he became far more uh, loving and, and, and caring in his outward behavior. So that to me shows some sort of uh, evidence that the, that mature, that, that process of maturing continues. Yeah, he, he had a worldly function to perform which wasn't being served by just sitting in a cave. And, and the, the performance of that function had, you know, an impact which is still being felt. You know, it sent out mm -hmm. ripples which are still washing up on various shores. Yeah. Yeah. And I, whether or not that means his in, per, own personal inner development was continuing, some would say that it's still continuing, that he's still, you know, he and everyone else, whoever existed, are still somewhere, still evolving, but it's another one of those issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think evolution continues. Yeah. 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 Um, it's, it's also, it's unending in a way, or it's still happening. We're still evolving. Even, uh, even, even us as human beings to awaken and then, you know, uh, after we awaken, there's still development that can occur. That's my sense of things. Um, you know, and talking, I've, I've interviewed a few people who, when I, I ask that question about, well, you know, how do you sense further development happening for you now? And they, they, they look at me like, what kind of a question is that? How could there be anything more? But um, most people have an answer. You know, they say, you know, yes, it's mm -hmm. still unfolding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you have this X sign on the wall behind you, and I guess that's the cover of your your book. And it was very significant for you. You had this whole experience of an X, and I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how much time we want to spend talking about that because I've never heard anybody else that had that experience. But you know, to to the extent that you think it might be relevant or interesting to people, um, maybe you could explain what what that was all about. Mm -hmm. uh, so the X is. Uh, or that form that you see behind me uh, and, and on the cover of my book, uh, that was another one of those vehicles of transformation. We we're talking earlier about the divine spark. This was one that showed up in, in that period where uh, I hadn't yet gone through the, that major awakening that I experienced at 22, but leading up to it, all kinds of subtle experiences were occurring that I didn't quite understand. Uh, one of them was the emergence of this luminous X that just appeared while I was in a writing class at university. Just in your uh, mind's eye. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was uh, instigated by the poem that I was reading. Mm. Uh, the poem I thought was written by a Canadian poet named Christopher Dudney, but I asked him since then. He goes, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> 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 but in any case, this poem, uh, as I read it, it launched my consciousness into an altered state. Again, I was the same uh, higher uh, dimensional level. I, my consciousness sort of zoomed up and, and out and above my head. And it was at, from that place that then this form emerged. Hmm. Uh, and I didn't quite know what to make of it at the time, but uh, I, you know, sort of came back down into my body and finished the class. I was sort of in a quasi state but this X continued to uh, emerge as I was going about my daily life so whether I was in school or at home studying or working at Swiss Chalet it would just appear hmm. and I began to realize that it you know wanted something from me who was trying to show me something so I sort of became more curious about it I was very at the same time kind of uncertain about it because it's an X it's a sort of a it's a striking symbol, you know, with yeah. different associations. But I learned to trust it, and as I did, uh, it would lead to the transformation of my ordinary state of consciousness into the non-dual state. And it did it by, as it would emerge in my mind's eye, I would just allow it to, and then I would focus on it. And as I did, 
pulses of light would would move from all four corners down to the center mm -hmm. almost like it wanted to pull me into the center mm -hmm. so it was sort of training me to do this and i would just watch it and allow it and if i allowed myself to become fully drawn into where the light the courses of light were suggesting me to go with my attention i would actually merge with the form mm -hmm. and at that point i would have an experience of the luminous nirvana that i experienced when i was younger i would have that experience but only for a flash and then right after that, the yantra, the light would dissolve, but I would realize, oh, I'm in the non-dual state. So it would precipitate. It became a, 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 an inner tool or um, vehicle of transformation that would precipitate the transformation of my own consciousness into the non-dual state. But that, wouldn't, it, that didn't hold. It wouldn't stick. It would fade away. Mm -hmm. And now uh, I, I uh, have put it out in the world because... E it's a it's what is considered a yantra. I now know that it's a yantra, and you can use it in the same way as a device. Yeah, a yantra is like a visible, like a a, a mantra. A mant whereas a mantra would be auditory, a yantra is visual, and it's a tool for transcendence. Yeah, and you know mantras are considered emanations of the divine, direct mm -hmm. emanations or yantras. This right. came from the divine. You know, that's, that's where it came. Yeah. yeah, and mantras are said to have been cognized too. It's not like somebody just dreamed them up and, and experimented. It's sort of like they actually cognize seed sounds that are intrinsic to creation that are conducive to transcending. And perhaps the same is true of, you know, of yantras. And That's all, right. And all kinds of archetypical symbols, you know. That's right, yeah. yeah. They're revealed. They're revealed through the, through the, uh, the inner journey. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, two questions have come in from people in Toronto. We've got a fan base up there. Um, one is a, an elaboration of what we were just talking about. Just, and it's a little bit of a semantics thing. Um, how, what is, how would you distinguish between an awakening and enlightenment? Keeping in mind that those are words and we can assign whatever meanings we want to a words, but how would you differentiate between awakening and enlightenment if you would? Well, just in, in the way that I use those terms, mm -hmm. awakening uh, usually is some sort of momentary or temporary glimpse. Uh -huh. And it may not be a glimpse of the full truth, you know. Right. So we can have all kinds of spiritual awakenings. We can awaken to the nowness of reality. And we, oh, we're like, oh, everything is now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we get it. And so that awakening leads to that. But enlightenment is the, the complete, um, or at least allowing, and this can happen in meditation or through spiritual experience, the complete, the complete dissolution of the ordinary sense of self mm. and a return to the primordial, eternal, infinite dimension of beingness that that, that you know that gives rise to your own awareness, but that it transcends it and in fact is the source and substance for everything in existence. Right. And the more that we uh, go through that experience, because sometimes one time is not enough. And, and for most people, the process of spiritual awakening leading to some kind of a permanent shift in consciousness to that enlightened state happens gradually over time. Mm -hmm. It's usually with spiritual teachers or people that uh, have made significant enough process on the spiritual journey in previous lifetimes that they go through these more dramatic ones for yeah. the average human being it's much more gradual mm -hmm. but we so we have to understand okay so what is the transformation that we have to experience and then the more that you experience it the more it leads to a permanent change in your overall sense of self such that you realize you're no longer just an ego or a personality or your particular body mind emotions thoughts all of that those are still all intrinsic parts of you as a human being, but who and what you are is more than that. Yeah, there was something good in there. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in there, but I want to make sure people caught it. I mean, sometimes people wonder, how, how come some people just have these amazing experiences as children and then they wake up, you know, so apparently easily without a whole lot of practice? And I think you just nailed it in terms of development in previous lifetimes. Some people don't believe in previous lifetimes and all, but I think that that's really a thing where, you know, people have, and it, it talks about that in various scriptures too, in, in the Gita, for instance, Arjuna asked Krishna, you know, what happens if you don't 
make it in this lifetime. And our, Krishna basically says, well, you pick up in the next one where you left off. You know? <laughs> uh, so I think there's a lot of that that happens when somebody is a child protege spiritually. Um, maybe even in other fields, like musically. How, how come Mozart was so good at the age of five or six, you know? Of course. Yeah. Has to be. Has yeah. to be. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, all right, well, I guess that covers that point. Um, so a couple of people asked a question along these lines, um, both again from Toronto. One asking if you had met other enlightened, if you have met other enlightened sages, and another elaborating a bit and saying, have you had any personal interaction with a living master or any mentor? Have you been a student of some mentor who could question you or hold you accountable? I think it was Adi Da who said that you know, de dead gurus don't kick ass. Uh, but you know, having so a he said what? De dead gurus don't kick ass. But I mean, oh, yeah. the, the implication yeah. is that, you know, if you have a, a close association with a living teacher, they can sort of put your feet to the fire and, and really make sure you don't get off on tangents or, you know, help to work out kinks in your personality and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they say that good students make good teachers. They, so, but have you ever really had a studentship phase under the tutelage of any spiritual teacher? No. Okay. At least not in this not, lifetime. Not because, I, not because I didn't want one, not because I didn't look for one, but mm -hmm. I never... Never found one that worked for you? No. Okay. So if anybody wants to ask any follow-up questions on that, they can. <clears throat> um, okay. Anything you uh, in the back of your mind at this point that you want to say uh, that I haven't been bringing up? Is there any like t interesting point that we haven't been touching upon? Not that I can think of. I mean, we, you know, we've gone into some pretty interesting stuff, I think. Okay, no problem. Just want to give you a little opportunity to jump in there. If there's, I have a few more points here in my notes that we can talk about. Um, sure. This is a nice one, just to throw in. We can maybe just dwell on it for a moment. You, in one, in your Heaven on Earth book, you quoted Hildegard of Bingen as saying, "Everything that is in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth, is penetrated with connectedness, penetrated with relatedness." It kind of reminds you of that notion of the net of Indra, you know, Indra's net, where every point in creation is infinitely correlated with every other point in creation, and that it's all just divine and intelligence interacting within itself complete, in a completely um, holistic or, or, what's the word, complementarity in physics, I think. Every, everything is connected with everything else. You want to elaborate on that, particularly in light of your experience? No, just that it's a, it's a, it's you know her words are based on a direct experience, right. which is something, which is something that we we can experience as again one of those uh, flavors or facets of awakening. Yeah. 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 At this point, one of the things that that I've come to understand is there's so many different realizations, so many different states of being um, that that we can we can enter into. And there are different practices that are more conducive to, the, you know, experiences of uh, non-dual uh, interconnectivity, mm -hmm. like one that you just described. And then, you know, there are other practices that are more conducive to um, states of realization of the absolute inherent emptiness of everything mm. or its uh, formless potential. You know. Do you feel that as we go through these stages? that you just alluded to that we're like the blind man feeling the elephant where we're we're kind of getting a sort of different perspectives on a larger reality and that you know eventually to you know using this metaphor if we become sighted if we lose if we we're, if we're no longer blind we can see the whole elephant we'll all see the same thing and so that in the sense of all these spiritual aspirants having all these different experiences, some are emptiness, some are fullness, some say there's no free will, some say there's free will, and we go on and on, many, many different flavors of experience. Do you feel like if there's a state of spiritual maturation, which potentially everyone could reach and eventually will reach, perhaps, in which we'll all sort of be in accordance with one another in terms of our view of reality? Uh, Maybe not in the way that you're you're sort of suggesting, uh, but I'm not really sure. I, I'll just say that 
with all of these different experiences that we can have, all the different kinds of, of spiritual experiences that we can have, uh -huh. what's more important is to just legitimate them. They're real. Yeah. They can happen. And because one teacher has an experience of love and another one has a, an experience of peace or another teacher has an experience of bliss, it's in the nature of that particular individual to emphasize the, 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 the different facets of, of awakening that they've experienced. So that becomes part of what they sh share. Yeah. Say, Rick, it's all love. <laughs> There's no love in the universe. It's all just peace and mm. it, nothing actually exists. You know? This is all a dream. These are all different perspectives that come from uh, states of being and real and the realization that go with those states of being. But all of them are the elephant because it's all the divine. Yeah, that's a good point. I suppose another way I might have asked that question is, is if Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, and Lao Tzu and a few others walked into a bar, you know, <laughs> would, would they all have, you know, agree with one another in terms of what the reality is. And I think your answer brought out a good point, and I've heard this said that um, that we all have different nervous systems and different makeups, different um, predominances of, you know, doshas, they call them in, in, in Ayurveda. And according to the diff our different makeups, we're going to, uh, even if we're all experiencing the same reality, we're going to express different facets or flavors of it differently. Like even the Vedic rishis, they, they had a certain cognition of one, one portion of the Veda. Another rishi would have another cognition. And it, no one had all the cognitions because it just doesn't work that way. You know, you, we have specialized capabilities. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think that's part of it. I think also, you know, uh, you know all, a, a meeting of all those, you know, great sages, they probably after they got over the difference in semantics, assuming they all spoke the same language, would probably all agree with the what I call the absolute truth, that all of this is happening mm -hmm. as an expression of some transcendent mystery from which nobody really knows where it came from, <laughs> and yet it created all of this. Yeah. Where they might differ is well, I've experienced. I had a vision of a donkey, then I went up, uh, you know, <laughs> into heaven. The others, I never, I didn't, I didn't write, I didn't see any visions. So they might differ on those, the, those particular details. Right. But I think they they would find agreement in an understanding of the actual mystery of existence. Yeah, and they wouldn't be killing each other over their differences as their followers tend to do. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's an important theme to you, and me too, is the notion that there is some kind of global awakening taking place. You can read things. I was just reading something the other day about the sort of most worst case scenario of global warming or climate change and how it could be way worse than you know even our most pessimistic projections, um, that, that sea level rise will be the least of it. Um, mm -hmm. And it can make you feel like, well, you know, I don't even know if the human race is going to exist in another couple of generations. But um, on the other hand, there's this spiritual upwelling taking place and people all over the world having spiritual awakenings and, you know, which a lot of people aren't aware of because it's more beneath the radar. But personally, I find it extremely um, inspiring and, and, you know, conducive to optimism. Um, so, I mean, what's your sense of that? And from either just a personal opinion or, or some kind of cognitive realization? Um, you know, evolution is, the, the evolutionary uh, impulse and, and um, what's happening now is sort of, it's forcing, it's forcing humanity to awaken in a way. Mm. Like how so? Well, it's sort of like crunch time in a way. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> like we're continuing on uh, with our current level of development, participating in systems that we help co-create because mm -hmm. of our own either lack of uh, understanding of any other alternative or, or just because this is the way we, we, ex we experience and accept that the world is. We're all participating in our human shared experience in a way. Mm -hmm. But yet we are also beginning to realize and more and more people are beginning to realize that the way that we're doing it is killing the planet yeah it's or potentially going to create a situation that is so irreparable that we may not be here 
Right. I doubt that very much. I think, you know, some of us will squeak through worst case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a case, it's like any, it's a case of, of, of like Easter Island. Are we going to continue to do this? Like, why haven't we stopped? Why are we not even like, we're not even barely tapping the brakes. And really, according to the ecologists, we should be hitting full stop and reversing. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's scary. I mean, you're maybe people aren't aware of what happened on Easter Island, but basically um, the the civilization there wiped itself out by cutting down all the trees and, and um, eliminating the the basis of their sustenance. Um, and we're kind of doing that on a global scale. But but there is this sort of hope. I mean, you know, it, it's not like accidental that there's some kind of spiritual epidemic taking place. And it may be actually in direct response to counterbalance the the devastation that that we're doing by persisting in our you know unlife supporting ways yeah you know we're like this as human beings we we uh, we put off what we know we have to do until it becomes situation critical yeah <laughs> do this in our own individual lives and it seems we do it collectively hmm. winston churchill said of of americans he said they they always can be counted on to do the right thing after having tried every other possibility <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> and I'm also, you know, I'm very optimistic just because of the, our level of technological development. Like, I, I just think, you know, when when push comes to shove, some whiz kid is going to invent something that's going to, you know, reduce the carbon imprint. Yeah. Is significantly. I just think it's just a matter of political will too. The capability is already there. I, I was reading an article about Elon Musk the other day, and he was giving a presentation to. I believe it was actually oil company executives showing that, you know, putting solar panels on 100 square miles of desert out in Nevada or someplace could power the entire United States. And you, you add to that, you know, localized solar panels so that there's, you know, we're not totally dependent on big transmission lines and, and batteries, which are getting good enough to, you know, hold a charge for a long time. And we're completely off fossil fuel is, you, you know, pretty much completely off. It's just a matter of will and, and political you know, an economic agency. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Here's a good question that came in from um, Manuel in Toronto. He asks, um, today, everyone wants to become a teacher. How do you distinguish a true realized being from a fake guru? <clears throat> no, you need a good bullshit detector. <laughs> yeah. How do you get one of those? Amazon.com? Life, life, life experience. Uh huh. <laughs> get burned a few times. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, I mean, there, there are all kinds of teachers. There are all kinds of, um, in any, in any human in, in endeavor, you know, like there are people that are really good at it. Then there are people that are average and then there are people that are complete frauds. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you hire them to do renos on your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same with spiritual teachers. Yeah, I guess that's a good enough answer. I mean, I, you know, I've interviewed so many hundreds now, and um, if I had to answer that question, I would just say, look for sincerity. Um, what you see is what you get kind of feeling from the person. Not putting on airs, you know, mm -hmm. not claiming to be something super duper special and holding mm -hmm. themselves above people, mm -hmm. you know, walking their talk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very often it can be just a sort of a natural down-to-earthness, you know, and they're not afraid to say they run a grilled cheese sandwich shop or, you know, or are struggling to make ends meet because they're raising a couple of kids, you know, as a single parent or something. And yet they have a wisdom and a sincerity and a, you know, intelligence that, that really comes through. Yeah, I, and I think it takes a while to get to know the answer to that. You know, you have to spend time with anybody. It takes a while to get to know a person. And the more time that you spend with them, the more you, you get a feel for who they are really, not yeah. make who they want you to, how they want you to perceive them, if that is in fact something that they're trying to do, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, falling in love with somebody versus having been married to them for a few years, you know, <laughs> really getting to know them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I suppose one, one we could answer we could give to that is um, don't just don't drop your critical faculties. There's no harm in 
asking questions and scrutinizing and you know expecting rational answers and if if someone is offended by you doing that not that you should be confrontational or rude but if mm. you know if, so, if yes. someone appears to be like trying to maintain a facade and is threatened by any challenge to that facade then you know be very wary yeah see what happens when you give them a, a you know a poke yeah yeah huh. Do they giggle? <laughs> <laughs> right. Or do they do they scream you out of the room for breaking the illusion of what what it is that they're you know trying to get you to you know buy into? Yeah. Also, other qu points are coming to mind. Are are they kind or are they abusive? You know. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. are they doing weird things with money? Mm -hmm. um, is there some kind of inappropriateness going on with sexual relationships with students? Anything like that is a, is a real mm -hmm. red flag. You know, do, yeah. do they rationalize that kind of stuff by saying that, well, I, my ways are inscrutable and you shouldn't question them and anything like that? All those things are... It's crazy wisdom. Yeah, it's I'm very leery wisdom. of this so-called crazy it's, wisdom thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. Um, okay. Well, we've covered quite a bit of ground. Um, Unless there are any further questions that come in the next few seconds, we could uh, probably wrap it up. Or if there's anything else that you feel you'd like to add, um, obviously let's let's talk about a bit what you have to offer. You're there in the Toronto area, and obviously you do things locally. Um, mm -hmm. You also, I guess, do some webinars and all online that people can tune in on from around uh, the world. Well, I, I, I'm I've just started using Facebook Live. So I here in Toronto, I offer uh, Satsang. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'll probably start um, broadcasting that on Facebook Live. Yeah. I just recently, uh, as you know, launched that project of walking in the woods <laughs> on Facebook Live. So I offer, uh, you know, sort of presence and guidance in real time, and you can tune into that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be doing that probably once a week after this episode. I just spearheaded it last week to see if it would actually work. It's something I've been dreaming about doing for a number of years. Yeah, I listened to that today while I was walking in the woods. Um, mm. Another thing you might want to consider, which I've, some friends of mine have found successful, is you, you set up a thing with Zoom, and then, mm. and then you have like you know, 20, 30 people or even more can join in, any number mm -hmm. can join in, and you give like a little satsang, you can talk for a, a while, and then they can ask questions, and mm -hmm. that, you might want to consider something like that. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the tip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of learning the technology and you know using yeah. it. Yeah. Well, my friend Jerry, who sets my guests up with uh, their equipment and all, says you're you you were easy to set up. You you seem to be a technically uh, proficient. Yeah, I, I'm okay with this stuff. YouTube's great. You yeah. <laughs> it's also a matter of time. Definitely, yeah. You know, time to do these things, but. True. Um, and uh, I also am available for one-on-one -on -one Skypes, and there's information about that on my website. Okay, and your website is stephendomico.com, right? Yeah. Okay, which is Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-D-A-M-I-C-O dot C-O-M. Yep. Okay, great. So, thanks, Stephen. This has been a lot of fun. Likewise. Yeah. I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity, Rick. It's great to actually finally meet you. I, I, I know I sort of mentioned, I'm not sure if I mentioned at the, at the top of the interview, but uh, it's really, this is like a, a dream come true for me. I have sort of, as a, as a spiritual teacher, after my awakening, I didn't say anything to anybody for 10 years because I knew I wasn't in any way ready or equipped to guide anyone anywhere. Well, it's funny yeah. you should say that because I often mention that apparently in the Zen tradition they say that after your awakening you shouldn't do anything for ten years. You know? I've heard you say this. Yeah, I heard you say this recently, mm -hmm. uh, and so that was confirming. You know, I yeah. got the time. I got the timeline right, <laughs> according to Zen. Yeah. And uh, ever since I discovered your work, I thought you know one day it would be great to be on your show, and and here we are today. Yeah. Well, I got the sense that the timing was right. I heard, I heard you say in your walk in the woods that you had just sort of. I don't know, you'd reach some point at which you felt like, all right, now it would be a good time for a wider audience, and then Irene got in touch with you. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, it was, yeah. Right. Well, so, th yeah, thanks again for, for, for having me on the show and also for doing this, because what you're doing is really providing uh, a platform for us spiritual teachers that are, you know, trying to convince people of these uh, very <laughs> subtle and esoteric truths that, People are like, I, I, I don't need that. Why do I need that? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, it's like we're all serving each other, you know. I mean, this is a great blessing for me to be able to do this, and it, it, it helps the teachers who, who do it, and it helps the people who watch and listen. So it's this kind of mutually supportive endeavor. Yeah, well, and, you know, that's why I called you the incomparable Rick Archer. <laughs> you spearheaded this. You, you have been there since the beginning, well, really. Yeah. Yes, in the beginning, God created Rick Archer. <laughs> <laughs> Back up. <out>, yeah. <laughs> then on, on the second day, he... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he smacked it in the back of the head. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, let me make a couple general wrap-up points. Um, you know, you've been, pretty much people know what I'm about to say. You've been watching an interview with uh, Stephen D'Amico on, on this show, Buddha at the Gas Pump. And uh, I've been doing this for about seven years now and intend to continue doing it. Um, so you can go to the, the site, batgap.com, to check out the previous ones. You can sign up to be notified by email of future ones. You can subscribe to the, U to the YouTube channel, which actually helps a lot. I mention this once in a while, but um, there's this sort of magic threshold you cross when you reach 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. They, they really sit up and take notice. And I, I've already been getting a lot of help from them. That, that it'll be even greater, greater if I ever reach that point. Right now, I'm still in the high 20s of thousands of subscribers. But if you haven't subscribed, you might click on the subscribe button. And then you'll be notified by YouTube every time there's a new interview. Um, then there's, there's an audio podcast of this if you'd like to listen to things while commuting or walking in the woods or whatever. And a bunch of other things. So just go to the site and explore the menus. There aren't too many things. but what you'll find there, I think, you'll find useful. And again, as I said in the beginning, we appreciate any financial support you care to offer, large or small. Um, so thanks for listening or watching, and we'll see you again next week, I hope. Next week I'll be interviewing Sri M for the second time, um, the very sweet, saintly man from India who has a very interesting story, and he's written a, a sequel to his first book, which I intend to read in the coming week, uh, which is subtitle of it is The Journey Continues. So I'm eager to see what he has to say and to talk to him again. Uh, so again, thanks, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Stephen. Oh, thanks, Rick. All right, good luck. Thanks. <laughs>